So let's take a look at our coin class here. Um, and let's make our coin class more useful by having it implement the comparable interface so we can compare one coin object against another coin object. And before we get into that part, we're going to write in a, later today, we're going to write a little static method um, just to test out this comparable stuff. So let's import a couple of things at the top. Let's import java.util.arraylist. And let's import java.util.collections. And we'll talk more about both of those later. Um, but what we want to focus on first uh, is making the coin class more useful by having it implement the comparable interface. And the syntax for this is we use a new reserved word right in the class header. This is where we commit, this is where we make the promise. Um, this is the contract between um, us, the author of the coin class, um, and the Java compiler. We make our promise by saying public class coin implements, implements is the new reserved word, comparable. And as we saw in the Java documentation, comparable is a generic, and so inside the angle brackets, we need to put the type um, against which we're comparing. So what do we want to compare a coin object to? Well, another coin object. That's pretty much always the case. So we just say comparable angle bracket coin. As soon as we type this, we just made that promise to implement all of the methods in the comparable interface. And in fact, if we compile our code right now, it doesn't compile anymore. The Java compiler enforces that contract and makes us keep our promise and says, wait a minute, you said you're implementing the comparable interface, yet you have not overridden compare to. So you better go do that. Okay. So the Java compiler enforces um, the condition that we must implement the methods of the interface that we're implementing. So let's do that. Let's implement compare to. Let's scroll down here a little bit. Um, hey, now we know a little bit more about to string. So we could actually put a little at overrides in front of here if we want, or at override, because we know we're overriding capital O object class now. Um, but let's also override the compare to method. So it needs to be public. It needs to return an int. It needs to be called compare to. It needs to take one parameter where the type of that parameter is a coin because that's the type we specified inside the angles brackets. Um, we can name the parameter whatever we want. When I write a compare to method, I always name the parameter other because for me it works out well conceptually. I can think about I'm comparing this coin to the other coin. And that helps me out. Um, one thing to follow up on from last week. Someone asked when we're implementing an abstract method, like from an abstract class, can we still do the at override? This showed up with the quiz and stuff. Um, and, I'm, and I said, I didn't know. Well, I looked into it. Yes, we can. Um, Java considers implementing an abstract method, implementing a method in an interface as overriding that method. So using the at override is, is certainly allowed and, and encouraged. Um, so we put in the at override there. All right, now it's up to us to actually implement the appropriate behavior of the compare to method in terms of determining whether to return a value greater than one, less than one, or equal to zero. So let's write some if else code to do that. What's going to determine for us whether one coin is greater than or less than another is that coin's value. So we have this instance variable value up here. So let's check. If this coin's value, oops, if this coin's value is greater than the other coin's value, return one. Else if this coin's value is less than the other coin's value, return negative one. Else, they must be equal, let's return zero. And now our code compiles because we have fulfilled our promise. We have implemented the compare to method from the comparable interface. So 
so this works just fine. Um, but an important follow-up question, do we have to return one here? What's another value we could return there that would still work for the compare to method? We could return a million. That'd be totally fine, right? We can return any positive integer. And so the reason why I'm making a big deal out of that is if you're calling, if you're invoking the compare to method, do not assume it returns only negative 1, 0, and 1, because that is not the case. Um, a reasonable question is, well, it'd be nice if that was the case, because that seems simpler. But there's a good reason why it's not. And the reason why it's not is we could actually, um, we could replace the above code with a single line of code, return this dot value minus other dot value. Being able to write little snippets of code like this is why compared to as the behavior it has. It's a lot more efficient, really, in terms of execution. We don't really care so much about the typing. Um, to do an arithmetic expression that results in a positive integer, zero, or a negative integer instead. Um, because if this dot value has a greater value than other dot value, it's going to return a po that difference, which will be a positive number. And if this dot value is less than other dot value, it will return some negative number. Um, and if they're equal, it returns zero. So it fulfills the contract of what compared to has to do, um, but in a much more concise way. So I'm going to leave this here as just like a useful note, um, but we'll stick with the more elaborate if else if else approach. All right, so great. We wrote a compare to method. We can now compare coins. What does that buy us? Well, let's write a test method together um, to, to illustrate this, to demonstrate this. So we'll just throw on the bottom here. We'll just add a public static void test comparable method just to give us a place to write a little bit of code. Oh, I'm sorry, let me take a step back. If we look back at this compare to method, um, value is a private instance variable, as it should be. We're inside the coin class, so that's why we can say this dot value, even though it's private. But what I wanted to point out is we can also say other dot value. When an instance variable is marked as private, it means that anywhere in that class we can access that instance variable, which doesn't mean it has to only be on this object. It can be on any object of type coin. Okay, we can, that's how we can say other dot value. So I wanted to point that out because sometimes we, we don't necessarily have that complete understanding of what private means. All right, back to here, back to test comparable. Let's create three coins. Let's create a quarter. So I'm going to say new coin, and when we construct a coin, we specify the value and then a string that describes that particular coin. Let's create a nickel. Uh, let's create a dime. Cool, so we got three coins. Oops. Let's put all the coins into an array list. So I'm going to create an array list of coins. And I have to initialize that new array list. So now I have an empty array list. No elements are in it. So let's add each of the coins we created to the array list. I'm just going to add them in the order we created them. So list.add quarter list.add nickel, list.add dime. And then let's print this thing out. And this is kind of exciting. I think this is the first time we've done system.out.println since we talked about the capital O object. So now we know that the println method takes one parameter and that one parameter is not of type array list of coins but rather that one parameter is of type object. And inside the println implementation, it simply calls the toString method on that parameter of type object. But since the ArrayList class has overridden the toString method, 
it uses its implementation instead. And we understand now that inside the ArrayList class and its toString method, it simply turns around and calls toString method on each of its elements. But the ArrayList class doesn't and can't know that it's actually those elements are of type coin. It treats them all as capital O objects and calls the toString method on each of them. But we've overridden that right here. And so it calls our toString method instead. And that's now we understand behind the scenes how this one line of code actually results in the whole list being printed, including our coins. So that's pretty cool. Perhaps what is even cooler, though, is on this new class, Collections. And Collections is a utility class. It just has a whole bunch of static methods that are useful for working with collections of objects. An array list is one type of collection. There are many types of collections out there. Um, we can call a method sort. And then we can print it out again. And here's the cool thing. The collections class and its sort method was written decades ago. It certainly doesn't know anything about a coin. But what it does know is it knows it can sort any an array list, any array list, as long as the objects in that array list are comparable. That's the power of the interface. So once you've got this typed in, go ahead, compile and run it, and look at what the output is like. <clears throat> all right, let me run this too, so we can all see this. Here we go. Here's the cool thing. It was in our list with quarter, nickel, dime, but now we can see it's sorted. Nickel, dime, quarter. And we didn't have to write the sort method. Okay. Now, if you're disappointed and you're like, but I really wanted to write the sort method, don't worry. That's what the next unit is all about. We'll write the sort method. Um, but this is, this is an example of why interfaces are powerful, because we can leverage, we can plug into code. A USB device can plug into a computer that has a USB port that was built 10 years ago. Um, but let's really emphasize this a little bit more clearly. So a reasonable question is like, well, last week we could have just written a compare to method in the coin class. Why do we actually need all this interface stuff? Well, not that you need to make this change in your code, but if I get rid of the override and if I get rid of this implements comparable thing and I compile, it doesn't build because it says, wait a minute, the sort method on the collections class, it can't sort an array list of coins. It doesn't know anything about an array list of coins. It can sort lots of things. It can sort an array list of comparables, but a coin isn't a comparable, so we can't sort it. So it's not enough just to have a method that says compare to. You have to be explicit and say that I am implementing comparable and I promise to implement that interface. That means a coin is a comparable and it can plug in anywhere you can plug in a comparable. So that's pretty cool. That's like the huge advantage of interfaces.